Welcome back to the True Sports Physical Therapy Podcast, a show that's by sports PTs and for sports PT professionals. We're here to accelerate growth in your sports PT career while giving you the tools to provide your athletes with game-changing results. Here's your host, sports physical therapist and practice owner, Dr. Yoni Rosenblatt. Welcome back and thank you all for listening to the True Sports Physical Therapy Podcast. This podcast just keeps growing and I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in, sharing your feedback, letting us know what you think so we can just improve and help you guys improve in your profession. Uh, The conversation you're about to hear was one of my favorite to record and one of the reasons was because I'm going to be talking to a true American hero, Warrant Officer Jeff Bull, although he would never admit that. And also because it speaks to uh, a major issue that we had early on at True Sports Physical Therapy where we would elevate and promote physical therapists to become leaders, but not really help them learn how to be a great leader or improve at being a leader. How do you build culture and things of that nature? Jeff speaks to all of those things in this conversation. He was highly recommended by a number of business leaders in my network, and they were right on the money. He was outstanding. We brought him in to speak to the leaders at True Sports. Um, And it was just a great day and a great use of time. And I couldn't wait to bring him on this pod so he could help sports PTs across the entire country, really across the entire world. I just want to take a second to tell you some of the accolades um, that Jeff has achieved, um, both in the corporate sector as well as in in the military sector. Uh, Jeff is currently an account executive at Dell Technologies. He was a senior program manager at Microsoft. There, he was responsible for federal customer operations and deployment of edge devices in supporting data centers. He also spent three years as a management consultant at the highly acclaimed McChrystal Group. Prior to that, he spent 11 years as a U.S. Navy SEAL warrant officer. There, he managed an 18-person staff and oversaw training of 240 SEAL candidates. He was in the Navy Special Warfare Development Group. He was an assaulter, a sniper, and a recon team leader. He served valiantly across 12 deployments through his 20-year career. Not freaking bad. His awards. He was awarded the Bronze Star with Valor five times. He earned the Defense Meritorious Service Medal twice. The Purple Heart, the Navy Commendation Medal, Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal five times. He earned the Joint Commendation Medal, the Joint Achievement Medal. This man has done it all. He embodies what it means to be a true hero. And most importantly, possibly, he now chairs and runs his own organization, Epizelus.org. That's E-P-I-Z-E-L-U-S.org, which ensures the health and wellness support of our military heroes. Please go check them out. Again, epizelis.org. It's an outstanding organization that I've had the privilege uh, to be involved with for a little bit of time now. Uh, This conversation is, as always, wide ranging. I look forward to some of your feedback, but Jeff is really going to teach us, and I learned a ton during this conversation, how to simply be a better leader. So without further ado, my conversation with Warrant Officer Jeff Bull. Welcome back to the True Sports Physical Therapy Podcast. This guest needs no introduction. You guys probably already listened to the the massive uh, career accolades of Warrant Officer Jeff Bull. Um, now switched kind of into the the corporate sector. So I'm really looking forward to to learning about how you apply all of your expansive military background um, kind of into your role today. Um, but but just to kind of get started, you've reached unbelievable levels in your career, both military and professionally. We at True Sports had the pleasure of, of bringing you in and talking to some of our leaders, and you just sparked so much dialogue and so much conversation within the company, which is exactly what we wanted, um, that um, I'm flattered to, to steal another few minutes of your time and, and spread some of that knowledge um, across the world to sports PTs. Thanks, Joni. I appreciate it, man. It was awesome hanging out with your team and and getting to spend some time with them. Um, Okay, so a guy with your background, um, why do you think I brought you onto this podcast to talk to sports physical therapists? 
Yeah, man. So, so I imagine like just from, from our interaction, right. Um, what, what I found is being able to tie unrelated skill sets to, um, and, but relating them to, um, other specific disciplines that, um, it allows people to not get distracted by their preconceived notions of, you know, leadership, for example, or different scenarios or situations. So me, for, for example, talking to a, a group of military guys that have been in for a while, it's certainly not nearly as, as impactful or allows their mind to kind of reach for how does that relate to my life and how does that re- relate to my profession, right? So being able to have something that's similar but abstract enough to, to where they have to think and close, close those gaps in order to make, make sure that it's relevant, um, I, I think is pretty, pretty powerful because then they have to be engaged, right? It's not just listening, you know, do, do this, do that, do that, because I have no idea how to be a sports physical therapist. Like, you know, I've got nothing to contribute there. The only thing I can contribute is my experiences and some, you know, insights I've been able to, to draw from what in, in some cases have been, you know, some ex- more extreme experiences or just very, you know, different experiences. And then the, the individuals listening have to figure that out, you know, and, and what is the lesson that they could pull from it? Yeah, well, well, you make that easy just in your presentation style. You, you make it easy to um, make those crossovers. So um, I think that's, that's a great fit. I think you're uniquely suited um, to speak on leadership and to speak on culture. And that's why I want to ask you to Warren Officer Jeff Bull, what is a leader? Well, man, so, so that's a hard question because um, there's so many layers to it, right? Like th- there's, I find it hard to, to provide a, sh- a short definition of, you know, what a leader is because a leader has to be so many different things depending on the situation, um, and the environment and the dynamic and, and, you know, all those things. And in some cases, a leader is going to be the person that's providing, you know, specific guidance and direction it says you will do, you know, X, Y, Z in other quick or other cases, the leaders just asking provocative questions, right. And then trying to get people to draw their own conclusions. Um, I think a leader is constantly assessing, um, the team. So, so it'd be a, a combination of, uh, I've had leaders come up to me and, and say, Hey, um, 85% of what we do is confidence and 15% is the actual like skill. Right. And, you know, as I grew up and, and real, that was like super impactful to me. Cause I just didn't, the math didn't make sense to me. Right. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about right now. How is that possibly true? But uh, what I realized at the time was that leader identified that I was lacking confidence in what I was doing at the moment in order to, to reach my peak performance level. And so he was trying to boost, you know, my confidence saying like, Hey man, you've got all the skills, you, you've done all the training, you've got the capability. You just need to believe in yourself in order to be able to execute. And he did that through, you know, this, this sort of abstract way of, of getting me to, to think differently that coming to my own conclusion. Yeah, I need to, I need to boost my own confidence Somebody else that can't do that for me, I need to do it for myself in order to perform at a higher level. So I, I feel like, you know, the term leader is is, um, is enabling the folks around them in order to be, you know, their, their most effective selves, right, for the team to accomplish a specific mission. Okay, so a leader in your eyes is an enabler, yeah. is a facilitator, um, and, and it sounds like they need to be nimble. Yeah, I, I would say um, certainly not all leaders are right. There's people that are in, in leadership positions that have their own style and way of doing business. And like, hey, this is um, this is the direction we're going. And either you're on the train and, and you're coming, or you're going to get left behind, right, or ran over, or, or whatever you know that that situation is going to be. And in some cases, that's that's effective, depending on the organization, the environment, and what is needed in the moment, right? But you know, to your point, being being nimble, knowing when um, when that enabling aspect is not going to get the job done, and and there needs to be a hard line, like, hey, let there be no ambiguity. This is what is going to happen, and I I appreciate if you disagree, but if you do, get out, right? Yeah. Um, that's not personally my style, but if if I came to the you know, assessment that that was the only way to get a job done. 
you know, within the time frame that was permitted, then, then that's what it's going to be. Right. When did you realize you were a leader? Hmm. Um, man, uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> okay. So, so it's yeah, I, I, while you think about that, I don't know that I've thought of myself as a CEO or a leader sure. um, until, until COVID happened, at, at least in the professional realm. COVID happens and um, obviously a, a massive trial and, and tribulation to businesses across the world. And I, I realized that I needed to manage my business, work on my business so that others could achieve their goals and provide great care. And, and I think like at that point, man, we, we flipped so many scripts, like so many people did at that point to say, um, we got to change the way we do this. We got to change the way we do that. We got to, how do we communicate with patients with cloth on our face? How do we do it virtually? How do we provide care virtually? How do I manage the business from a comp structure? Um, the government could tell me to shut down tomorrow. So if that's the case, we need, we as a team, as a group need to be nimble. I, as a leader, um, attempted to be nimble. It's the first time I looked, looked at the situation like, Jesus Christ, I, I think I'm leading this whole thing. So while, um, I just wasted a whole bunch of time talking about myself, hopefully it gave you a chance to, to think that situation that you were in when you're like, holy cow, I'm a leader. When was it Jeff? Yeah. So, so I don't know if there's a specific situation other than I realized, um, you know, how I presented or, or carried myself was, I think, noticed by, by others. Right. And, and in the Navy, there's always an opportunity. There's an expectation of you grow as a leader. So, so, uh, as a, a enlisted person, you go through different blocks of training. And, and for this one was particular as, as an E5, where you're beginning to come up into sort of like lower middle management, you know, position. And one of uh, my peers who I, I had gone through buds and training with, he was in the same class. And it was one of those things where you had to go to and, you know, check the box for two weeks or whatever. And, and then you could, you could be promoted and, and move up from there. And, um, and I remember one of the, the instructors asking if like my dad or my family has had a legacy of like being from the SEAL teams or, you know, something like that. And I was like, no, why? You know, my dad was actually in the Peace Corps. Um, and, and I was, and I wondered why they, they said that. And they're like, well, compared to, you know, the other guys in this class, like they seem really excited, you know, about what they're doing. And they're, they're like, oh, this is, you know, we get to do all these amazing things. And I was just very sort of nonchalant about it. And just like, yeah, you know, like, it's the same thing that you're doing. It's just different. And, you know, I'm still in the Navy getting trained, like doing that stuff. It's not, it's not that big, big of a deal. Um, and, and they're like, Oh, well you, you just come across, you know, very differently than, you know, some, some of the other, the other folks. And I, and I think at that, you know, time I, I, I kind of realized like, okay, how you behave in a, in a different environment, people are going to look at you one way or the other. Right. So they're either going to look at you as, as like super excitable or, you know, this is fresh and new, or they're going to look at you like, Oh, you, you seem like you have a little bit of wisdom, you know, or ex experience about you and, and so on. And so I think, you know, after that, um, you know, I've started to pay attention more, right. Um, in, in regards to um, how I, I, carried myself and how I interacted with people, um, how I, I leveraged, you know, uh, my background and, and, and that sort of thing, you know, kind of, kind of tying to the COVID thing. I had retired in 18 and then, um, you know, kind of, kind of reached this point where I was leading, uh, the operations of, of McChrystal group out of, out of Alexandria, which is a small, um, consulting firm under Stan McChrystal was four-star general. And when COVID hit, I actually felt good again about, because there's action that needed to happen, change that needed to happen. Right. And so it, it, I wasn't in an environment where it was just like rinse and repeat. This is the way we we've always done things and, you know, and go suddenly it was like high stakes, right? There was a lot of stress you had to do something because if you did nothing, you were not going to survive. Mm -hmm. And, and suddenly I felt 
alive again, right? Like I, I was operating and that was actually my wheelhouse. And, you know, I've talked to plenty of people, you know, since then where a lot of folks were really in a bad space. It was super stressful. Nobody knew what was going on. Right. Um, and they didn't enjoy it. But like, for me, I was like, oh man, I, I, this is the environment that I thrive in. Right. So, so I think as my career progressed, the more stress that I was under, the better I was able, able to focus when, when uh, I find that when things are calm and there's just not a lot of things to do and it's just like things are moving along, that's where I struggle because I'm, I'm looking for, you know, uh, action to take. And a lot of times that's not the right answer, right? If, if things are working, sometimes you, you just need to not mess with them. Yeah. And, and I think that's a skill in and of itself. I, I hear you describing um, a very calm individual and it makes me think about um, a conversation I had with you um, I don't know if we were in freezing cold water or if we were in really hot water. Um, but at some point I, I asked you how it was that you were able to complete, um, some of the, the deep water skills that they ask you to do, um, in training. Um, and I was asking specifically about some type of not tying endeavor that transpires, uh, way underwater. Um, and I said, I would freak the hell out. Like in that instance, I would freak the hell out. And you said, you learn that the quicker you freak out, the poorer your performance will be. And so trying to find this level uh, of calm amongst the storm or amongst the pressure um, is, is the secret. Easier said than done. How do you stay so calm in the face of pressure? Yeah. Um, I, I feel like it's a muscle, right? Like that, that you, you develop, um, and then you begin to see, um, when it needs to be turned on. Right. And, and to me, to be honest with you, I think sometimes I'm looking for an opportunity to turn, turn that on because it is sort of my Zen, you know, space, my, my comf comfortable space. Um, and I can't get there if, if there isn't external stressors that are, that are kind of, you know, at, at play, um, which is probably a shortcoming of mine. And I, you know, am working on that meditate, like doing, doing all the, all the things. Right. Um, but I, I don't find that comes easily to me if, if I don't have a, a lot going on, which, um, so I, you know, I do think that muscle, um, it takes so much brain power and so much effort that in order to focus, to be able to, to be able to calm yourself. Right. So like when you're underwater and you need to breathe, there's so much going on, right? CO2, CO2 build up in your lungs. Uh, your muscles are burning. Your lungs are burning. Your, your body's trying to take a breath. You can't cause you're, you're underwater. And so you have to like mentally overcome and control what you can with some level of faith that you will get an opportunity to breathe if you wait long enough. And when you get the opportunity, you can't mess that up. Right. Um, you know, because if you're in the ocean, for example, there's waves coming, if there's helicopters, you know, overhead while you're still waiting to catch a breath and there's spray, you know, coming in your face at the same time, like you've got to, you have to wait for the, for the right moment. And when you want it, it isn't necessarily when it's going to come, but when you need it, it will be there. Right. Um, and so I think to some degree, like the face, you know, aspect of it, of, of just like, Hey, wait for the right time. Right. And if you're constantly you're, and you're assessing and you're looking and you're like, okay, the right time's going to come. And then w when you see it, boom, you, you, you got to take that moment. Right. Okay. So, um, first of all, I felt like I was just about to pass out when you were describing that. So n now that I didn't pass out when you're describing that, apply that, that ability to stay calm, that ability to constantly assess and wait for your opportunity and seize it when it's there, how does that show up in corporate America? How does that, sh how does that show up in my every day as a sports physical therapist? Yeah, man, I, I would say in the corporate environment, it's a grind, right? Um, and it, the, the pace is slower. And so that assessment and the patience has to increase significantly, right? So when we're overseas operating, everything's on a 24 hour cycle, right? You know, the cycle of darkness, essentially you're operating, you're bringing in information, you're assessing where's the next target going to be the next day. What is the battle space, you know, seeing from an environment perspective, and then you go out, um, 
operate, adjust, and then go go again. In the corporate environment, things just don't move that quickly, right? Um, and so you have to allow the that assessment period to, to go longer and then accept that um, a lot of people aren't going to be on the same wavelength that, that you are uh, for a, a variety of reasons, right? Um, it could be personal life things going on. It could be um, business-wise. They're what they are trying to achieve doesn't necessarily align directly with what you're trying to achieve. Like there's so many different variables, but the reality is um, I think there, there's a, a mentality is the world conspiring to do good for you. And once, once you just succeed or is the world conspiring for you to fail and, and want you to fail. And if you look at the world through the positive lens, then nobody's waking up in the morning looking at Jeff, thinking about Jeff Bull, like how am I going to ruin his day to day, right? Like how can I say no to him so he gets super frustrated and and upset and, and pissed off? Or if you look the other way, where you, you're thinking like, okay, yeah, people, you know, the world's working against me and everything is is a fight and a battle and and a struggle, um, and so that that assessment focus aspect now there's roadblocks every single day, right? Uh, things that get in the way, slow, you can't move nearly as fast as you want to, or th that you think that you should. But what I found is like explaining, taking the time um, to explain to the people that I'm in engaged with what I am trying to accomplish, why I'm trying to accomplish it, accomplish it and what I've been doing in order to get there. Uh, suddenly those people get on board, right? And they understand, um, especially when, when you start, talking about the history of it and, and number of leaders that are engaged with you and that you've got support at the corporate level, you're just trying to get them up to speed. The majority of folks that I, regardless of, of uh, at what level within the company that I engage with, they just don't know, right? Because they, they haven't been along for the journey. So when I hit them and I need them something from them and I need it timely, they don't know. And so if I blow up you know, immediately, the, the chances that they're going to want to work with me again in the future is probably like zero. Right. So I've really had to, to grow um, my patience, you know, and, and say, Hey, if I'm not getting what I want, more than likely it's because they don't understand. So now I have to help them understand. And then once they do, it gets a lot, a lot easier. The problem is a lot of times they lead you to somebody else. That person doesn't understand. So now the cycle starts all over again, right? Yeah. And and so um, you know something that in my mind would would take a couple of days suddenly is taking two weeks, right? And it's really hard not to blow up after two. Like for goodness sakes, like somebody <laughs> just do what I, I'm asking to do, right? Yeah, yeah. So that the, the lesson I heard there, because this shows up in our, this shows up in everyone's life, the, the, regardless of what you do, um, but. The what, the why, and the how, that shows up in the sports PT world in two facets. One, when you're working one-on-one -on -one with an athlete or a patient, they want it done at a given time. They, they don't have the experience to know that a hamstring tear takes this amount of time, right? Sure. So how do we take a step back and say, here's what you did. You tore your hamstring. Here's what that means. This part of the muscle pulled away from this part of the muscle. This part of the muscle pulled away from the bone. This is how long, standardly, on average, it takes to heal. So that's the what. We're going to help it heal. We're going to get you stronger by doing this. That's the why and the how kind of wrapped up in one. And if you can do that, to your point, calmly, now you got buy-in from the athlete right now yeah. you can understand it's going to take a certain amount of time um the, the second place it shows up is uh, i call it more professionally less clinically but more professionally is if you take a step back and i got a pt that wants to get to a certain level um on the corporate ladder for lack of a better term can you take a step back and say here's what i'm trying to accomplish here's why i'm trying to accomplish it i want to learn x or i want to make y and how am i doing it if you know where you are either as the clinician or if I can explain as the leader of clinicians, all of a sudden things begin to kind of slow down. Um, and again, to your point, um, we're working together. You're not conspiring against me. I'm not conspiring against you. We're working together to achieve those goals. So 
I told you you make it easy to, to cross these, these lessons off. How do you, and you hinted at it a couple times, um, you thrive under pressure. And so when there's not pressure, how do you say to Jeff Bull or how do I say to myself, don't create stress? Right? <laughs> yeah, man. I'm, I'm horrible at that, right? So um, it, it, is, it is much easier to create stress, right? Like either artificially or, or you know, otherwise. And, and I think that's part of the reason why, uh, you know, while I was working full time and still deploying, I was also going to school, you know, in, in some cases full time at the same time. And, you know, my wife was having kids and we were raising two boys and, and, you know, moving to different parts of the country. We just had a lot going on. Right. Um, and, and I found like when I increased my voluntary stress, uh, stressors was, was when my operational tempo slowed. Right. So, so as, as there was more space for, for me to take on more stressors, I would just fill it, you know, with, with whatever, you know, I, I could. I still struggle with, with that. Right. Like, um, I'm aware of it now, which I think is different than before, before I would just naturally do that. And, and then, um, now I can kind of see where, when I'm, when I'm starting to, my mind's starting to water and wander, look for different options, you know, where can I apply myself? And then I start seeing that I'm like, maybe I should just like, mow the lawn, right? Like if, if nobody needs anything right now, like maybe I should just take some time and like get outside, go work on the yard, um, you know, chill out or work on some projects and find something to do with the kids or, you know, so something like that. So I think like get, getting that awareness of what my tendencies are and then trying to counteract those. But I don't, I don't know that there is a fix for that. And I don't know that we want one either, right? Part of what, what makes you effective is, is that, um, you're, you're always working. Right. And, and we used to say it in the SEAL teams, like always be working when, when you're on target, um, and you don't have anything to do, then find something to do. There's, there is, um, uh, you know, security to hold on a door. There's, you know, um, uh, look for Intel, look for gear, equipment, some assessment there, there is work to always be done. If you don't have anything to do, then find a way, to, way to be productive. So I don't know that we want to turn that off completely, but certainly do want to find a way to decompress and, and allow yourself that, that downtime. I, I think when you're doing those things, uh, you're spending time with the kids, you're mowing the lawn, you might think you're not doing something, but you're actually enhancing, uh, your performance. You are doing something to better yourself, which is going to allow you to accomplish your goals better. Don't think that you're not doing anything, right? You are doing something. Um, it just might not be the exact task. Um, you thought you were going to be doing that day. So to me, that sounds a little bit, um, like how you may handle this work life balance conundrum is, but, but maybe I'm off. So, so let me just ask you, how, how do you handle that work life balance? So this is a really good conversation. Um, I don't really prescribe to the work-life balance uh, scenario, right? Because when you say balance, that suggests that the two things are equal, right? There, there's some sort of balance and, and, and equal. Um, and then, so I asked this to a group of kids that are going to, you know, boarding school with, with my son. And I, I said, who, who here feels like they have a balance, you know, school life versus, so, you know, social life or family life. And everybody's like, you know, no way. They were just starting school. It was 100% school, right? I'm like, right. So th I think it's more uh, advantageous to say work-life alignment. So there's going to be different times in your life where your family life needs to realize that work is going to be a priority be for whatever reason, right? Um, and that you need to really kind of step up your focus and energy towards work. At the same time, there's going to be plenty of times in your life when that's going to have to take a side seat while you focus on family and whether there's like health stuff going on or just like vacations or graduations or whatever it is, and you need to be there for the family. So, so then suddenly work takes a, a lower priority, right? So I, I feel like it's a, it's a moving scale. Sometimes it'll be balanced. Sometimes, you know, it won't, but if there's alignment, and, and I think the world is doing a lot better now 
allowing for work to be deprioritized when people need to prioritize their personal lives for whatever reason, right? Um, and and I feel like as people are are more open about some of the challenges that they have, you know, in in their life, mental health, um, family, all, all those sorts of things, the team understands that and is also super supportive. I've not seen a single time on my team when somebody's like, hey, I've got something going on. I need to throttle back on work a little bit and really focus on here. But when I come back, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, I'll be on. Right. And, um, and everybody allows for that. Right. Because, because they want that as well when they need it. Yeah. Yeah. I think they want it. So let's say like whoever's, um, keeping score wants it themselves, let's say. Sure. Also, when you look at productivity and, and happiness and success in the workplace, I've come around on this a, a good bit I, in my career. I'm sure I have a, a long way to go with it, but um, it's a better product when the coworker, when the teammate um, has the other boxes checked. And so go yeah. check those boxes because that way when you come back in, it's going to be a far better product. The way we look at it um, at True Sports or, or working with athletes is like there's this massive seasonality, right? So summer, winter. Sure of these athletes like come come into our um auspices and you you gotta lock in that's when you lock in so what that means is when they go back in february end of january that's when you got a plan right that's when you you can throttle down on the work um but you, you have to have that macroscopic view of what is the seasonality where are we and like you said before, like you're underwater trying to figure out how to tie knots. You know you're going to be able to take breath. You're going to get the opportunity to put your head above water. It's just not right now. Right. And so if you can see that coming up, February's coming, let me lock in in January because I know February's coming. Let me take advantage because if you don't take that breath, sure. you're dead. You're never going to get through summer. So just yeah. make sure you, you, you come up in February for some air. I've thankfully had the ability to learn that um, from from my teammates, from people that I work with, because I think I'd be uh, still drowning underwater trying to figure out those knots, right? That would, yeah. That, that, would, that wouldn't work. Um, and, and when you can define that seasonality as well, right? Like then, then you could plan a trip, you know, in, in February or something like to really help you lock in because you're like, man, I can't wait to go down to Bahamas or, you know, whatever, like that's going to be amazing. And then maybe that gives you just a little bit of extra juice that you need in, in order to, to really perform and, and stay locked in and, and focused. And I think, um, have you read the book, do hard things? Yes. I just read it actually. It's great. Amazing book. Right. Yeah. Um, what I, I love about it is, is the idea is like, people working with themselves really right and and figuring out like hey right now i just need to get to this that stop sign once i get to the stop sign then then you know it'll be the next thing and, and be the next thing and and taking that approach of like needing to manipulate manipulate yourself almost right in, in order to continue to push and, and drive and those are the people that end up are that are capable of 50 miles 100 miles in extreme conditions and not the people who are like i'll be fine like it's not going to affect me. It, you know, th those are the people who are going to end up breaking, right? Because it, they haven't allowed themselves to go on this emotional roller coaster where th they are going to be like jacked up and jazzed and be on point and then realize like, man, at some point, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, be low. Right. And I, I found that even with education, when I was taking classes, I would start a class and I'd be fired up, man. And I, I'd be like, super interesting. I'm all into it. And like six weeks later, I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> like, yeah. I just want it to be over. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you start getting closer to the end. You see, you see the light at the end, the end of the tunnel and, and then, and then, you know, second, third wind kicks in and, and you finish strong. Um, but I was able to predict it. Like I knew that, that that was going to happen. Right. And, but then I could also then plan for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think when you come out as a, as a rookie, Maybe it's your first class. Maybe it's your first job. Maybe it's your first time being deployed, although I've never been deployed. Um, you got to figure that out. And you got to figure out what is the seasonality because you've never seen it, right? Sure. And that, that's why you see like um, pro athletes hit that rookie wall at, at week 10 of the NFL because they've never played a week 10 to 17. So the guys who figured out, and I've seen this with, with the pros that I've worked with, is they find a mentor who's been there. Um, so, it, you know, if you're an athlete listening to this, find that mentor who's been through the entire season or find your coworker who's been working 
for a year, two years, three years. They've seen it. How yeah. do you handle it? When can I throttle down, et cetera? What can you predict? Um, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of value there in applying that, that lesson. Now, you get to SEALs, right? And you get to SEALs training, which is, is that Buds comes in? Buds, yep. Okay, so you're in Buds. Um, there's no slouch in Buds. No one accidentally goes to Buds. These guys are freaking rock stars, right? Yourself included. So I see this a lot when, when I hire a PT who was um, a collegiate athlete, Division One athlete, who obviously has brains because then they went and got their doctor. They're an alpha. They're a stud. Well, now they're working with a bunch of studs, right? And so everyone on our team hopefully fits that model. Um, they are high achievers. They're overachievers. Same thing in the SEALs. When you're in that environment, how do you stand out as a leader of studs? Yeah, so, I mean, some of it is positional. You know, you're expected based off of, um, you know, your time and service and, and what you're doing. And, and there, there will certainly be, you know, a, a pool of individuals that do stand out, you know, from the rest. But like you said, on average, you know, SEALs are identified as trainable, right? Like if anything, um, you can provide them a task, teach them how to do the task, and then they will figure out how to do the task. And then the majority of them will then say, okay, how can I improve, you know, this, this task or how, how effectively I'm, I'm able to do this or efficiently or so on. So, so standing out, when you're in that that pool of people of, of high achievers, I think the first thing is everybody realizes is like, oh crap, I'm surrounded by, you know, this group of of amazing uh, individuals that are really capable. And you know what, um, I'm not the best at every everything here, right? And and rarely is there someone that is the best at everything, you know, right. across the board. Like there's just going to be different little nuances. You'll have your 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 top performers, and and I've seen, you know, top performers from a a performance standpoint, like how fast can you run, how fast can you shoot, and and the different skill sets that didn't really weren't really vocal um, in regards to leadership, and they really didn't stand out as wanting that those leadership roles, right? Like they were happy with their level of performance and, and didn't want to be responsible for other people. Right. And then you've got other folks that are like good performers, um, but really enjoyed the leadership aspect and, and ownership and, and that sort of thing. So I think some of it's just personality driven, you know, like um, there, there are some folks that seem like they weren't really interested. They would fill a leadership position if they were asked to, but they weren't going to pursue it. Right. And so if, if you're standing in a group of people and say, like, hey, I need somebody to lead this next evolution, like there's not they're not going to throw their hand up. Right. But if you ask them to do it, they would do it and they do an amazing job and they, they would they would crush it. Um, and, and a lot of times the folks I mean, that's part of leadership's job. Right. Is to identify those those folks, the people who aren't saying, hey, give it to me. I know I can do this and do it really well. But identifying those people and then pushing them you know, and their, their, uh, level of comfort and saying, Hey man, I need you to run this. I need you to take, you know, take, take this and, and get these people, um, aligned and, and get this done. So, um, yeah, I, th I think some of it, uh, is everybody's constantly assessing, right? Where do you, do, where do I sit on, on the hierarchy or the, the food chain? And then again, patience to, to know when it's your time. I joined the Navy when I was 19 years old. Um, fairly, you know, young on, on, on the spectrum. And then at some point that shifted, right. Where I wasn't the young guy anymore, but because I joined at a young age, I had a lot ex of experience for my age when I started to get into to leadership roles. And so my, my age and rank didn't necessarily line up with my combat experience and, you know, capabilities and so on and so forth. And so, um, that's something to be patient about it as well. Right. At, at one point, Leadership came to me and said, hey, we can't give you a troop position probably for like four years because we've got senior guys rank wise and age wise that are waiting for it. And so even though, you know, you should be there in two years, it may end up being four because, you know, we, we've got to give, you know, these people a shot too. 
Well, at that point, I've got a decision to make, right? You know, from a career path trajectory, do I want to wait that long? Do I want to look at other options, do do different things? There's, there's a lot of things, you know, on, on the plate. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if that, that fully answers your question. Well, I would take it a step further and ask you another question, which is when you're when you're greeted with that decision to make, um, how do you voice the fact that you think you're ready? Sure. Um, without sounding like an asshole. Yeah, totally, man. It, um, that, that's, that's the hard part, right? Um, I, I think two anecdotes I, I could offer you there, right? I was in Iraq in 2006 and I was, uh, uh, E five, I think. And, but, uh, middle manager. So, so like enlisted, you know, level five, it goes up to nine. So E five is like right in the middle, right? Um, and, and as you move up, the harder it is to get there. So there's a lot more at the bottom of the, of the, you know, pyramid than, than there is at the top. And all my peers were E sixes in large part, because, um, I, at the time seals didn't have a rank. It wasn't a job. You had to have a Navy job. And then, um, seal was just sort of its side designation. And my Navy job was, um, a radar tech. And so a lot of what I had to learn in order to be able to promote was know how to use, you know, radars. And and a lot of it, what I needed to learn was inside of the secure space, um, because it was classified or, you know, that sort of stuff. I didn't have access to to that space. And I wouldn't have spent, even if I did, I wouldn't have spent time doing it because that wasn't my job at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't pass the, the academic test to be a good radar, you know, technician, um, which is called the operations specialist in the Navy. And so I was stuck at, at this lower level from a rank perspective, but I was leading the, the troops, um, from a, a recce point man perspective. Right. So I was planning routes, you know, where's the target, where are we going to land? How are we going to approach the target? How are we going to get there? And I would spend hours every single day, whether we were hitting a target or not, planning and, and figuring out if we could, how are we going to do it, and so on and so forth. And some of the other guys just didn't have that same level of responsibility at you know at the moment. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly, it was coming time for all of us to reenlist, and they were getting like ten thousand dollars more than I was because they were higher rank than me, and and I was just like getting after it, you know. Yeah. Um, and so then, then it was just sort of a matter of principle, right? Like I didn't care about the rank or, you know, pos- positionally it really didn't mean anything to us, but, but, I, you know, it, it was a thing at the moment. And I was like, look, man, um, and they had the ability just to promote me, right? The, the command had the ability just to be like, you know what, you're doing a good job. Here you go. E6. And it wouldn't, wouldn't have been any skin off their back, but they didn't. And so I was like, you know what? I understand that this is the requirements, but if um, if I'm not viewed as valued enough in order to be promoted to E6 so that I can be on par with my peers, then that's fine. I will continue, you know, I'll finish out my commitment. I said I would do four years here, I'll do four years, but then I'm gonna move on, I'm gonna go be successful somewhere else, right? I love it here. I love what I'm doing. I don't want to leave, but I'm also not going to undervalue, you know, my contribution. And, and then I'm, I'm just going to go find work elsewhere. Mm-hmm. That wasn't being a dick, right? That was just, here's how I feel. Right. And the next week I got promoted to E6. It didn't help with the reenlistment because it yep. pushed, pushed a year, but it kind of, you know, I, I stood a ground, my ground articulated it without being a jerk and just being like, Hey man, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I can do this or I can do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would say a similar sort of scenario came up from um, a team leader type position because I had a lot of experience, but my rank was was lower because, you know, again, stunted, I think, you know, partially during during that scenario. Um, they were like, hey, this is an E7 position for, for a Navy chief, but you're an E6. So, you know, we're going to give give the position to, to an E seven that didn't have as, as much experience, so on and so forth. And I'm like, yep. Hey man, like that's fine. However, here's where I'm at. And, you know, in, in regards to that. And so it wasn't being, being a jerk and you know, any, any of that stuff, it, it was just like, Hey, I hear what you're saying, but here, here's, 
what I think and here's how I feel. And, and I think that I'm ready based off of these deployments and these actions and these, these sort of things that I'm ready for, for the next step. And, and I want it now, if you don't think that understood, and then I've got some decisions I, you know, I need to make. And, and that's not me being like, I'm going to take my basketball and go home, but clearly I've got some decisions to make if you don't think that I'm ready. Yeah. Um, so that the key factor there that you kept coming back to is you communicated appropriately. And, and I think the difference there, it, it might be the same outcome. You might take your basketball and go elsewhere and go home. Sure. But first you communicated to say, here's where I am. Here's what I'm thinking about. I, I've seen this concretely. I, I almost feel bad, like comparing our sports PT world to the life and death decisions that, that you're talking about. But the, the correlation is I got a stud PT. I got a guy who can manage, who can market, who can treat his ass off, who can put the work in, who can relate to patients, whether they're um, a 24 year old running back or an 80 year old um, geriatric population or patient. Um, he's awesome, but they're guys above him. They're guys who have been there longer, right? So if that guy can come to me and say, listen, I know that this PT has been here longer and you don't have a million clinics to offer me. So, so he's next. I'm just letting you know, one, I want, I want to grow Two, I'll simply have a decision to make. If you go elsewhere, I crave that as a leader or a guy making a decision. I crave that. And I'm sure your superiors or the people you reported to appreciated the fact that you just communicated. Um, here's where it is. Here's where I am. Here's the situation as I see it. Maybe you see it differently. Let me know. Um, that's, that's gold. Yeah. That Jeff, if there's one thing that comes out of this conversation is enhance your communication. You can't communicate too much as long as it's done appropriately, maturely, um, and, and in a well thought out fashion. So thanks for, for that. Absolutely, man. And yeah. then for, you know, having been on the other side, you know, as a leader hearing, you know, people communicate effectively like that, um, there's, there's other things that you could do in order to make it good for everybody. Right. So like in, in the example that you provided, like, Hey man, I hear you. I can't give you this right now. Right. Like I can't, but what I can do is give you this and you have a path. I have a, a vision for you to move up in the company and like continue to do, doing what you're doing. But, you know, here's an opportunity for additional schooling or, you know, what, whatever other incentives that that you might be able to provide. And sometimes just leadership communicating like I agree with you. You are a freaking stud. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I do see you as a leader in this company. Um, we just have to line it up with timing and, and so on and so forth and make it, make it good for the company and, and for you, like sometimes that's enough, right? People just want to know that like, Hey, I think that I'm, I'm putting out, I think that I'm, I'm performing at this level. If you agree, then we're good. Yeah. 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 And, and finding a role. Um, I think that's awesome. So l let's take that. Um, the next step, you obviously you're a leader. Um, I have a number of people that report to me. What's the best way to garner feedback from those who report to you? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of formal processes now, like the, you know, the 360 thing. And then, um, you know, every six months or something, you may you're supposed to sit down with your leadership and you do, you know, to, to the people that report to you and then, you know, and then back the other way. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting I find like a less formal interaction is typically way more effective than, than the formal ones. Right. But they also have to be authentic. And so sometimes the, the formal ones can just be a block box checking exercise, right? Where, sure. all right, man, I know you're asking how you're doing because you're supposed to do that. And I'm supposed to give you some sort of feedback. And so let me, you know, make something up. Um, so it sounds like, we're engaged and we're, we're doing what we're, we're supposed to be doing. Right. Yeah. Um, but typically what, what I've found from a leadership perspective, as, as you are listening to people that work for you and you're hearing about the challenges that they're facing and, and you're kind of mentoring and giving, giving some advice, like that conversation should then flip over and be like, Hey man, let me, 
ask you, what else could I be doing to helping you out? Am I doing anything that's like adding stress or like not helpful or, you know, is there anything more, more that I could be doing? And I think like in that, in that flow of the conversation, you can get some more authentic, um, sort of discussion, you know? Yeah. Is there, is there a way to best, um, dis, disarm, um, that interaction? I find it very hard. No one wants to piss the boss off. No sure. one wants to say something that, I don't know, might get held against them. How do I make those who report to me more comfortable sharing the way they feel about my leadership style or, or my performance? So, so I've never been a CEO, bro. So I, I can't offer you a whole lot there. And I've never been like the general of a, you know, a force or a large, you know, group of company. I've been a leader of, of a training detachment and, you know, and, and the, the folks there. Um, and I would, I would say in, in those cases, it was um, just asking for help, right? So it, it'd be like sitting down. If I'm, I genuinely want um, to improve, in this case, the training detachment in Kodiak, I was running, you know, cold weather, uh, mountaineering and, and uh, water operations in Kodiak, Alaska for about two and a half years. I didn't know anything about cold water or not cold water, but anything about winter warfare. I was, you know, in the jungles, you know, SEAL Team 4 prior to Iraq and Afghanistan, and I spent all the time, you know, over, over there. My wheelhouse was not mountains and was not snow, but I didn't – so I'm, I'm running this this training group. I didn't need to be the expert. I was surrounded by experts. They all knew knew what, what to do, right? And because I didn't have to expend energy on – the nuances of do we use this sleeping bag versus this one or, you know, so, some of those things, I was able to spend my time more on like, how, how are we operating organizationally? How effective is this training within the pipeline? Do we have all the, the tools and resources that we need? And so I was able to sit down with those guys and, and just be like, Hey, where is my time best spent in order to improve the organization? Right? Like, Let's think a little bit crazy. Like, what if we had our, our own range out here? You know, like, what if we had, instead of just doing basic training, we did advanced training and then, you know, we increased the, the number of throughput um, and, and those sort of things. And so I think asking for, for help and, and first recognizing your own limitations, right? And just being like, look, man, I don't know everything. In fact, I'm pretty dumb when it comes to these things, but that's why I got you guys, right? Mm -hmm. So now that we've established that, you guys are smart and I'm dumb. What, what needs to happen and where, where am I best focusing my energy? Right. I love that. Uh, so it's asking for help. That's one immediate takeaway, um, that, that I heard from you. The other thing is you, you didn't say it outright, but you definitely gave an example of, of not faking it. Don't pretend like, you know, like, like I shouldn't pretend that I know how to, rehab a lacrosse player and how to teach a roll dodge or a split dodge or even what goes into that better than the guy who won a national championship doing those things. Sure. Let, let me ask them. But, it, but if I fake it and I start talking like as if I know, they're, they're going to smell it immediately. Immediately. The fastest way to lose credibility, right, is, is if people know that you are pretending that you know what's going – because you feel like you should, right? Mm -hmm. Not because you know, or you actually have experience, um, you know, and you immediately lose credibility. And I think you gain a lot of credibility when you know, but you ask anyway, because you want to hear what their opinion is first, right? And then if you are the expert in any specific thing, like, let me hear where your head's at. Let me hear like your approach. I want to, you know, learn from you. And then if there is something, if there's nothing to add, cause it, you know, that was a hundred percent lined up, then like, dude, I think you're good run with it. And if there is something to add, like, I love all that and try, try this stuff too. Right. Yeah. That that's gold professionally speaking. So like when I'm dealing with other PTs, I think that would be really helpful to em employ. The other thing is when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with an athlete, I, I try to say, and be as transparent as possible. I, like I've never put on a helmet and run full speed into another grown man for a living. I've never done that. 
Um, I've never been 250 pounds and six foot four and, and run a four, two, 40. I've just never done it. I'm not going to pretend like I can. Sure. Last night I was working with a linebacker and I showed him this exercise that I thought was a great exercise. Um, I said, dude, he, here's why we're going to do this exercise. I think when you come around the edge, you have to get at this angle. I think this foot is going to have to dig into the ground and propel your giant body that way. Is that right? And so he, a lot of brains on this guy, he goes to the whiteboard and says, well, actually like here, here's the way I would come around. So it would actually would be the other foot and, and here's where my shoulders would be. And so th that was awesome, but I couldn't pretend or, or just push it. Like we're doing this exercise because X, Y, Z, he'd be like, dude, you've obviously never put a helmet on and sure. crushed a person. Right. Um, I then went on to show the exercise and almost killed myself showing him the exercise, but I apologize to him for not being able to show it. He's like, you're here to tell me why it works and how to do it, not show it. So just know where you are and where sure. you fit in. I, th I think, I think that goes a long way. And I, I think, I think that guy has an appointment with me next Friday. So I think he's going to come back, you know? Um, but, but that's, that's really good information as to how I can relate to, to those who report to me and, and try to bring the best out of them so I, that I can be better. Um, sure. I think that, I think that would go a long way. I mean, the reality is like, you don't have to establish anything, right? Everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows what you've done. Everybody knows the power that you wield. Right. Um, and, and I think that was one of the biggest lessons I learned from Stan McChrystal while, while I was working over there is like, he never presented himself or came across like he knew the answers, right? He knew he was surrounded by a lot of smart people and a lot of capable people. And he could listen to the conversations and steer it and, and get the organization going in, in the direction that he thought was right. He didn't know it was right, but he had strong suspicion based off his experience that, you know, that these things were right. But I haven't had a single experience with him where he comes in and he's like, we are going to do this. You know, this is going to create, you know, this, this sort of outcome or so on and so forth. It was, it was always like, Hey, in my experience, I've, I've found, and I, I still use this, that just switching up the order of phone calls, like, you know, I've, I've got an agenda, uh, extended team meeting every two weeks. And if we stick with the same people talking in the same order, nobody's paying attention. Like the people at the, the end aren't paying attention to the top because they're like, uh, I'm only worried about what I have to say, but the whole point of the conversation is so that everybody has a holistic view of the operating environment, what's going on and how does this thing relate to that and so on and so forth. And so Stan would just be like, Hey, I'm not telling you to do anything, but sometimes, you know, I found that like just mixing up the order and then keeping people on their toes, like forces them to pay attention. And then, you know, they're not cutting their fingernails and, you know, doing pushups instead of paying attention to, to the conversation. Um, and, and I, th I thought that was, was pretty amazing, right? Like he didn't have to establish who he was. Everybody know, knows that. Um, so being, being able to bring the calm, you know, and enable people to, to have a little bit more ownership, uh, always seemed a lot more effective. Dude, that that's awesome professionally, but also clinically when I'm working, when you're working one-on-one -on -one with an athlete, when someone's working one-on-one -on -one with an athlete, don't mail it in. Don't let them think they know what's coming next vary your inputs right it yeah. keeps it keeps that athlete engaged so long gone in our clinical world are is the world of okay uh today just like yesterday you have your three sets of 10 of squats and then we'll move to this and then we'll because that's what we did yesterday we, we've decided to like burn that model because the athlete goes to sleep and, and then the athlete they're not learning anything they don't need to come back you got to show them why they need to come back. Yeah. Same, th same thing with your teammates, right? Professionally, they should know I got to go to this meeting because I don't know what's going to happen. Something good is going to happen. I'm going to get something out of it. Sure. Um, but I don't know you, you gave great example of doing that when you moved over to Dell. So the, what you do at Dell is not what you did in Kodiak. No, different, no. very different. No. And, and so I think, don't let me put words in your mouth. You told us that you rely on everyone there. They're the experts at Dell. You don't know what the hell Dell is doing, but you, you know, all these other skills. Can you just speak on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I always wondered like, why the heck do I have a job? 
like, why do they need me? Right. Like they're, they're, I just don't bring any sort of technical prowess to, to the conversation. What I do bring though, is an understanding of the need and the outcomes that the customers are trying to achieve. Right. And, and the importance of what they are trying to achieve. So sort of being able to articulate uh, priorities and get resources and, you know, focus Dell's internal energies to what is important for, for the customer is really where I, I come in. If there's a pro, I only get called if there's a problem, right? Nobody, nobody's like, Hey man, everything's going great. I get called when like, I need this. It hasn't shown up. Like what's going on or something broke. I need, you know, I'll order new ones, but I need a replacement right now or whatever. And so I'm like, all right, hold on. I'm making phone calls. I am more of an executive assistant to the rest of Dell, like all the resources to and my customer, right? Like I'm just trying to pair up the subject matter experts with the, the problem, which I suspect is very similar, you know, what, what you, you all do. There's a problem. What's the solution? You, and you got to marry those things up, right? There is a lot of benefit, I would say, also not having that technical background is because I am... I can only go off of cues of of the customer of like, are they happy, sad, glad, mad, scared, you know, like whatever. Um, And then the same thing with my team. And so I'm listening to these, these interactions and a lot of it, to be honest with you, sounds like beep, beep, boop, boop, you know, it's like in between, Mm -hmm. but then I'm able to just be like, I'm hearing you need Dell to come back with a definitive answer of, are all these components working? And here's how we know all these components are working. Is that right? Yes. My team, hey, are we able to provide that on what sort of time, reasonable timeline? And, you know, let, let's get it done. And so being able to translate um, between those those two things, man, I think um, pr- helps provide clarity. Because when you, when, when you get overly technical, you can kind of get lost in, in that world. Yeah, understanding the need. That's, I think that's what great leaders do. And that's, that's leadership through service. And that's, that's what you're doing at Dell. That should be on your, on your business card. That should be your title. That's, that's awesome. Um, Warrant Officer Bull, I could talk to you forever. Um, I got a lot more to learn from you. So um, at the risk of taking too much of your time, let's go to our lightning round. Send it, man. I want quick answers, okay? Yeah. Don't give me any of this Zen BS. Like, I just want rapid fire, okay? Here we go. Number one, do you believe in aliens? Yes. You think they've been here? Yes. You think the government has proof of that? I don't have any insight into that, but... I said, do you think? Yes. (laughs) Oh, jeez. I'm not going to bed tonight. Okay. Um, what is the biggest misconception of being a Navy SEAL? Uh, I, I think it is um, that, that we're just aggressive individuals. You know, I, I don't think uh, people probably view us as very cerebral uh, individuals, which is, you know, understanding. But the majority of, of guys that I know are, are quite uh, thoughtful, I would say. Yeah, you, I mean, you talked about when you came in and spoke to True Sports, you talked about how originally you were um, attacking missions, for lack of a better term, being fired up, um, and, and rapidly you learned that wasn't wasn't the key to success. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so, so it, in that case, it, it was, um, I would sort of artificially jack myself up to imagine, like, if I was on target and people were shooting back, like, get, increasing my heart rate, um, and then, you know, my, my peripheral vision would kind of like zoom in and I, I'd be like, all right, I'm going, going into this room. Um, but then I, I very quickly, I'm always observing other people. Right. And then seeing the folks that I, I assessed, um, and you know, every, everybody would be like, yeah, that person's amazing at close quarter combat and you know, the, these different tactics. Um, and I would notice that the guy was just walking around like he was walking into an ice cream shop. Like it, he didn't look like he was going, you know, walking in straight into a gunfight. Um, and, and so I, I started to 
just pretend and, and emulate that, right? Like, hey, why am I getting all fired up? I, I've got things I need to do. I need to clear my corners. I need to assess whether, you know, the target has a gun or not. I need to clear behind obstacles and then just like, just go do it. It's like, it's, no, it's no, not that, that big of a deal. But then that translates when it, you know, it comes go time, like, you know, on the field, or, or whatever, whatever it is, like if, if, um, if you're calm in that environment training for that, and that's your sweet spot, because you could go the opposite, right? Some people need that, that extra um, energy or, or whatever, in, in order to help them perform. So I think it's just a matter of figuring out like, where, where are you uh, topping out at, right? Know thyself. Yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting. Okay. Um, what's your favorite leadership book? So I'd have to say, because I I work for Stan, you know, McChrystal, uh, the book Team of Teams was uh, was really interesting for me because I was 25 years old when I first got to the Joint Special Operations Command, which he he was uh, leading at the time. And I was on the opposite spectrum, right? Like he's at the top and then I'm, you know, out, you know, in the the field. Um, And I, I always, I grew up in that environment thinking that's how people lead and operate in general. Um, and then very quickly, as soon as I left there, com- came to find out that that was a unique, you know, operate uh, operating environment and how transparent and collaborative and um, and and the, the team environment that just didn't doesn't compare, I think, um, anywhere else. And some some of that was like based off of the environment and, and the need at the time, like we um, people were dying and therefore uh, people start doing the right things right in order to, to try to prevent that. Yeah, I, I guess you learn quick in that in that environment. Um, I can only imagine. Okay, um, as a student of history, which I know you are, the the one figure from the world's history that you would love to grab a beer with. Man, um, good question, man. Uh, I think I'd go with Abraham Lincoln. I Why? I feel like he could probably drink a lot of beer, man. <laughs> skinny. Skinny. He, he is skinny but i feel i feel like he's one of those guys that would could just keep going you know like you're like where's he putting it and he just like yeah. keep, keeps crushing beers and gets super hammered and I, I feel like a drunk abraham um would just be comical man yeah and and what do you think you'd learn from him uh um you know i for, from a the how he was able to take such a contentious environment and, you know, the cabinet that, that he built um, of people of just such different polarized, you know, perspective, but somehow was able to get them to work together and, you know, in the best in- interest of the, the country, um, I think would be fascinating to, to hear, like, was it deliberate, you know, was it planned or, or did, um, did he know what he was doing or did he get lucky? Right. Um, uh, and so I, I always think that 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 would be an interesting thing to kind of pick apart. What a leader, man! What a unifier! Yeah, you know, so, so so skilled. And could you imagine, like now, you know, like it, it, it's could could we be any any more polarized, you know, and and find somebody to uh, to kind of be that that bridge? Um, but you know, who, who knows? It, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like anybody is is that interested right in in Wait, being that is, is this you announcing your candidacy no way man because <laughs> you got my vote um, okay tell me tell the this uh this really awesome world of sports pts and enthusiasts about your organization and how they can find it and what its mission is and how we can support it yeah man thanks i i appreciate that yeah so um you know, with 20 years, years of service, you know, in, in the country have, haven't been at war for as, as long as we were there, there's a lot of consequences to that, right? Some good consequences, some not so, so great consequences. Um, so my personal journey, um, you know, was diagnosed with PTSD somewhere around 2013. Um, but we were, we're still deploying and we're still getting, getting it on. Um, you know, quite a bit. So, so the goal was how do you stay in the fight and, and, you know, address whatever needs to be addressed and, and then get back out there. And so a lot of, um, and I'm sure you can relate with this. Um, a lot of us were just looking for the easy button, you know, give me, give me the pill, give me the shot, give me the whatever um, in order to help me get through the season. Right. But the problem was the season never fully ended. You're, you're recycling and you're getting ready, ready to go back, back in. 
And so, um, so as I retired, what I found was there were a lot of resources available to special operations team or folks, right? There's a lot, there's a lot of nonprofits and it's, it's attractive, you know, for people with money to say, yeah, I have relationship with, and I'm tied to Navy SEALs or I'm tied to Green Berets or tied, tied to those things. Um, and so I was able to get a lot of sort of unconventional resources, uh, so like ganglion block access to, you know, top therapists and like all sorts of stuff in order to help me keep my mind, you know, right and where, where it needed to be. But what I found was, is my, my, uh, community and circle kind of didn't include so much just being the, the special operations centric folks now up in Northern Virginia is I would come across folks and kind of talk about my journey that, you know, I'd hear like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like, I think I could use that. How do I, you know, get access to those resources or, or my cousin's a Marine and, you know, he's really struggling. Like, can, you know, can you get him into the pipeline? And so I found myself like begging these different organizations to go outside of their, their mission and, and, you know, help other people. And understandably so now that I've got, you know, help co-found this, this organization with my wife, Epizelis, um, we, I understand why that is that you have to maintain that, that narrow fo focus. Right. So what we did was, uh, my wife was like, why don't we just start our own? And then that way, if you come across people that need help and they don't fit within one of these categories and you can just help them, you know, and, and really it's about, you know, providing funding and resources and access to a lot of these, these treatments. So, um, at epizelis.org, it's www.epizelus.org, um, is, is the website is where vets, you know, that can come in regardless of background and, you know, all, all those things. If you're struggling request, um, really financial support or, or um, you know, access to, to some of the, these other um, resources, be it ketamine, cell ganglion block, or some, you know, some unconventional stuff. Interestingly enough, the majority of our funding really just goes towards talk therapy. Um, people are having a really hard time, I think across the country, getting access to, you know, quality mental health care. Um, and so just helping people, you know, get funding for that or, you know, whatever it might, might be, um, has, has been quite helpful. That, that's really powerful. And is it all, um, mental health focused? I, I would say, um, we, it is mental health focused, but the, the good thing is, is we're, we're small. Right. Um, and so as long as it aligns towards, um, reintegrating the veteran into the community and if it, if it is tied to some sort of like physical ailment or support, like certainly uh, willing to support that. Cause the other thing I would say is that all, it's all tied, right? You, you can't have a physical um, challenge issue going on and not have that affect you mentally. Right. And then a lot of times the other way around, if, if you're aren't right in your head, then a lot of times that'll translate, you know, um, into physical issues as well. Yeah. That's, it, you know, it's, it sounds like such a great organization, um, and, and I'm happy to support it in any way I can. And, and the reason I say that, I'm, ha I'm happy to say this on the pod, is should any of those physical ailments, um, like, fall under our expertise as sports PTs, I, I would love to, to help in that world. So, so you have a vet kind of come across and say, um, I need a stellate ganglion block that ain't my world you have a vet come across and say i'm having a lot of trouble with my knee shoulder whatever call me yeah call me and and just let us try to help not just with our pocketbook but but help with uh, although that's important so make your donations to epizelis.org but but maybe maybe we can help with that which we know how to help with um, and get people physically back to where they need to go and see how that, that helps their, their mental state. Um, please take me up on that, Jeff. I think that would be for sure, man. And, and really like what I found is the power of the nonprofit, like, yeah, there's the, the funding support aspect of just trying to get people out of crisis, right. So that they, they can begin to, to figure out and come up with a plan um, for long-term maintenance and, and so on. There's that aspect, which is, is good. But what I found is like the network that gets built is more important, right? Because there's a there's a diverse need out there and people are at different stages of, of what they need. And and I just had a conversation yesterday with a group 
that is working with the NFL in order to tie vets with former, you know, NFL players that were also, you know, retiring and going through this transition period. And it's sort of like, Hey, um, yeah, you're both in like weird spaces right now and, and it's challenging and it's, and it's, um, disruptive. Like let's throw, you know, you people together and see if you can be mutually supporting through, through this process. Um, and so the, the more, um, exposure that, that we get to people like yourself, who's, who just have a unique skill set and capability or willing, willing to help, man. I think that's, that's where a lot of the goodness comes from. That's really cool. Um, okay. So epizelus.org is how we find that. Uh, we can reach you through that. Should, should yeah. that come about? Okay. That is awesome. I, I mean this wholeheartedly when I say this. So look dead into your camera and take this in, Jeff. Thank you so much for your service. We're not here without what you've given our country. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's been, been great growing the friendship with you, man. It's, it's been a fun adventure. Yeah, well, let's keep it going. Um, to everyone out there listening, thanks so much for, for listening and, and learning and now supporting Warrant Officer Jeff Bull. We, appre we appreciate the dedication, so share this thing. Thanks, guys. Thanks, brother.